Joining us now is a man who is a former fullback and Super Bowl MVP. He played for the Miami Dolphins and briefly right here with the New York Giants. He is a Hall of Famer, two-time Super Bowl champion. He is a member of the 1972 Miami Dolphins, whose undefeated 17-0 season earned them the honor of being named the best team in NFL history. He is also the author of a great new book, Head On, a memoir, which pulls back the curtain to share how the Dolphins achieved their legendary perfect season. It is a thrill to welcome the man who, along with Jim Kick and Mercury Morris, was one one of the greatest running back combinations in the NFL history, as well as one of my all-time favorite players to play the game, the one and only Larry Zonka. Welcome, Larry. Mark, thank you. That's quite an introduction. I don't know if I'm deserving of all that. Well, I, I, thanks, first of all, so much for joining us. And I have to tell you, as a kid, my dad and I had New York Jets season ticket hold season tickets in the early 70s. But every Christmas break, we'd go down to Florida. And I think maybe it was because of that Miami Dolphins song that played endlessly on, on Miami radio that the <laughs> Dolphins became my second favorite team. As you can see, I'm, I'm pretty big. I was a big kid then. So poor Warfield, Bob Greasy, or Mercury Morris, when we played in the school, just didn't fit. So I was always a zonk. So this is a big thrill for me. Um, your book gives us a roadmap into what really made you. Your life really could have went in so many different directions at so many different points in your life. I think maybe the first major turn concerns a juvenile court judge in Akron, Ohio, and a man named Lawrence Saltis. Can you share that story with our audience? Well, just a piece of it. I, you know, it's quite a long story, but it's involved. But Mr. Saltis was a... Uh, man that was probably 50 years, 55 years old when I was a, a kid in junior high. And he had become our science teacher and was in fact the, uh, because nobody else wanted the job, he was also our, uh, our, our uh, principal of sorts. In other words, w when you got out of line, he took the paddle and hit you on the butt with it. You know, he was that kind of guy. He was straight up, but he's an intelligent guy and he's very uh, forthcoming and uh, kind of an honorable guy. You know, if he asked you, he expected to hear the truth from you. And I, I respected him for that. And I got in some trouble with the police. We went downtown Akron, 12-year-old boys, and we're walking back at Halloween. And instead of walking all the way back, we saw some bicycles. So we borrowed the bicycles and uh, rode them back to Stowe, which was about six miles. Instead of walking, we got to ride the bicycles. We then deposited the bicycles in front of the hardware store. Unbeknownst to us, the guy in the hardware store saw us. And he knew me because I sold strawberries out in front of his hardware store sometimes. Make a long story short, they called the police. Police came. I ended up in front of a juvenile court judge. And he was scratching his head, looking at me and deciding because I'd, I'd been in some other scrapes. I'd never been in front of a judge before. But And he uh, he just looked at me and said, do you know that guy named Saldus? And I said, well, yes, he's my principal, junior high principal. He said, uh, you like him? I said, yes, I do. And he said, uh, have him call me. So I went and told Mr. Saltis, make a long story short, Saltis called the judge and they decided that I would report to Mr. Saltis's office every every uh, day during the, the, the school week, and uh, which I did. And he handed me, uh, he said, do you like football? And I said, well, yeah, I kind of like football. Uh, the first day I reported to his office, <laughs> this, is the, this is where it gets kind of heavy in the book. Um, he said, well, have you gone out for it? And I said, yes, sir, I did. I went out in seventh grade, but they didn't have a seventh grade team. So I had to play with the eighth graders. Of course, I didn't know anything about the game. So I ended up holding a dummy and I was a practice dummy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I got knocked down a lot. And I said, uh, he said, so what'd you do? I said, well, I quit and went home. I said, I figured if I'm going to get knocked down, I might as well be a Holstein or a Jersey uh, knocking me down. The cows at home do a pretty good job. On it. I don't need to do it at school and at home. And so I quit. He said, okay. He said, but you did like it. I said, well, I liked it for a little while, but I said, I'm really, I don't know anything about it. He said, there, that's the key. So my punishment was to report to Mr. Saldus, my junior high principal. And he gave me books about football, diagrams of how to run plays and everything. He had me name all the positions. He schooled me on the in, inner workings of football. And I don't know, you know, Mark or AJ, either of you have that knowledge from when you played, but having knowledge when you go on a basketball court, when you go on a volleyball court, anything, you know, football, hockey, whatever it is, if you understand who's who and what's going to happen when, when the ball's in play, uh, you have, you're miles ahead of anyone else on the field, particularly in junior high. 
So that kind of turned me back to football and got me back interested in it and uh, made a big difference in my life. He, it, right there was a, a great turning point because I, I don't think of myself as a criminal, but I'm one of those kind of guys that I like to bend the rules. If I can get away with it, I'll bend the rules. Would I, would I steal something? Call from? No, I wouldn't. I'd stop short of that. But, you know, there's there's a lot of place, a lot of gray areas where you can get in a lot of trouble. You know, one of the things I can really relate to, you wonder why did he have the book in his desk? And it turned out, as you learned later, he was a high school football official. I can relate to that because my father was a longtime high school football referee. Absolutely. See, Mr. Saltis really liked that. He really liked all us kids. Yeah. He wouldn't hesitate to hit us on the butt with a board. We, you know, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't bother him a bit. But on the same hand, he'd also take that extra time. He'd actually go out and referee. He didn't coach anymore then because he was he was a little older and had a lot of responsibilities at the school. But he refereed a lot of our games. And I lost the game. I mentioned it in the book. I'm walking off. I just couldn't handle losing. Never could. Still can't. And I was just totally dejected. The other guys thought, well, we gave him a good game. Well, that was all horse feathers for me. I didn't want to give anybody a good game. I want to beat him, you know, and uh, I'm walking off all dejected and he put his arm around on my shoulders. We're walking away. It was just he and I in the parking lot walking out. And he said, uh, what's the matter with you? I said, I don't like losing. He said, that's good. He said, but let me tell you something. He said, you were the only football. He said, keep this between you and I, but you were the only football player on that field today. I never thought about that. I never thought about, you know, it was just me. I, I identified with the team. I didn't identify as me and what kind, what kind of job I did. He said, you have nothing to be ashamed of. You're the only football player on that field today. And that was the spark right there. When he had yeah. displayed that confidence in me, you know, it's funny how in your life, you think back, I don't, you, AJ, you guys think about Mark, but there's, a couple of points in your life where you decided which way to go and it was influenced greatly by one person and uh, sometimes good, sometimes bad. I don't know. Maybe, you know, it could have been just as uh, influential if it would have been somebody that influenced me in a bad way, perhaps. I don't know. But right then when he said what he said, it just something clicked in my head and I thought, I'm going to, I'm going to stay with this football thing. And uh, I went into great length, explained all the background in that in the book, but that gives it kind of a thumbnail right now. Yeah, it's one of my favorite quotes in the book. And again, you, you mentioned the different people that influence you. And, and it's so clear, the roadmap for, for your success. You're a defensive player, but a bad kick by a Ravenia high school kicker in the final minutes of your sophomore season changes everything. So one of those other turning points, what changed in that particular play? How did it change the way Coach Dick Fortner saw you? And, you know, again, one of those things that changed your path. Well, I identified with running the ball because I used as a kid, again, here we go, we'll go right back to the thing, bending the rules. I got to go to a Browns game <laughs> on an occasion where some of the peewee baseball guys or something, I had some tickets. They had an in, knew somebody, and we got some tickets, and we got to go to a Browns game, which was like 50 miles north of where I grew up. Went up and saw the stadium and everything. I was just mesmerized by it. Well, I couldn't couldn't go back <laughs> because he only got tickets one time. So some of us boys got together and devised a method of, uh, we cased the place and saw that the delivery trucks went in at like six o'clock or seven o'clock in the morning, be game day. And they all had a code that they tapped in and drove up the gate. Well, guys that drive delivery trucks at the stadiums don't really care whether two boys jump on the back of the truck and ride into the gate. <laughs> they don't pay a lot of attention to that at seven o'clock in the morning. So we would go up and jump on the backs of those trucks and go in and watch the Browns game. And to answer your question, I watched Jimmy Brown run the ball and watched how he worked with his offensive line. And because I understood from what Solis had showed me about how the game worked, I understood how well Jimmy Brown read his offensive lineman. And I thought, I can do that. But I never had a chance to because they never put me in the backfield. I was too big a kid. But then it happened uh, in the Ravenna game, as you pointed out, in high school, a sophomore year, uh, there was an onside kick and they put me up there because the other guy that was supposed to be up there was injured. So I got it. It was a backup. So I was up front and that ball get, bounced in my hands. And I just picked out the smallest guy I could pick <laughs> and tried to run over and did that two or three times. I didn't score. I didn't save the game. But what I demonstrated, the head coach saw, and uh, uh, he saw a willingness to put your head down and go for it, you know, head on. And uh, 
That's where they got the title. That's when that started. He the next year he gave me a shot at fullback. He just gave me a shot. Then Coach Schwartzwalder at Syracuse did the same thing. Gave me a shot and uh, give me a look, and it worked out. Amazing. Again, you know, um, you know, you see Jimmy Brown, but the guy that you really looked up to and patterned your game around was Chicago Bears fullback Bronco Nagurski. And you had a lot of the common, you know, traits. And you share a Bronco story about a particular run in a 1933 game versus the Red uh, Skins. And it's one of those urban football legends. And just reading it, and like you, you know, as much as we might all hate social media. Man, I wish there was YouTube because I would have loved to have seen that run. Can, can tell our audience about that particular run. I, through reading the books in Mr. Saldis's office, I got to know Bronco Nagurski by name and by reputation. I never saw him play. I never had that great honor. But uh, in 1962 or 63, they built the Hall of Fame. They built the original part of the Hall of Fame. And being the industrious 13-year-old that I was, I knew that I wasn't going to get a ticket. So I figured I got a buddy named Ron Mahoffer, whose father owned a Chevy dealership. <laughs> so Ron had a whole beat-up Chevy, and we drove it down. Make a long story short, we snuck into the building of the Hall of Fame in order to, to see. I was hoping I would get to see Bronco Nagurski because he was there. He, the, man, the gentleman was there. And sure enough, we snuck down through the bushes and got to where we didn't have any badges or anything. They turned us away at the gate. So we went up through the woods and came down and ended up right at the end of the stage in Bronco Nagurski standing about 12 feet from me after I snuck through the bushes to get in to see him, you know, and I'm, I'm just mesmerized. I'm looking at him and he looks right at me and kind of smiles. And then he nods his head, like, look over there kind of thing. And just as I go to turn, an usher grabs me and drags me out the gate. <laughs> but I got to see Bronco Nagurski, and I stood 12 feet from him. And that's when I started thinking about, you know, he played running back and defensive tackle. And, you know, he that's back when he played both ways and had to stay on the field. And I had tremendous respect for him, and I thought, by golly, if he could do that, I'll bet I could do that. And that was the incentive. You know, that's uh, by reading those books and then seeing that gentleman. And years later, I got a chance to meet Bronco Nagurski in person, shake hands with him. And I, I asked him, you get a kick out of this. <laughs> I asked him, do, do you remember when, <laughs> and he looked at me for a moment and said, well, yeah, sort of. I thought he doesn't remember, but you know, to me, that's funny. So years later, when I was going into the stadium, I saw a lot of kids uh, standing around outside. I'd usually grab a couple of them and walk them through the gate with me and turn them loose in the stadium <laughs> just, just because that's how I got in, you know. <laughs> it's also interesting because the you know, before that Hall of Fame meeting, you talked about that run in a 1933 game, which ended up with Bronco running in head first into a brick wall too. And like, yeah, you know, somehow I just visualized the number 39 running into a brick wall. So they had some great stuff about Bronco in the book as well. Yeah, well, that was taken from other books. I I heard about all of that and read about that as a kid. And I'm sure that was over some journalists probably, you know, added to that. You know, I don't think Bronco broke the, the concrete wall down. <laughs> I don't doubt that he might have ran into it. But that's back in the days of leather helmets and before. Uh, you know, that's, that's pretty hard to believe. But I know that, uh, you know, there was a couple of fellas that ran the ball back then that, uh, you know, in the Chicago game one time, they said Bronco almost knocked the horse down that the cop was was sitting on. And I can believe that I could, I could see, having grown up on a farm and uh, been around critters and things. I can see somebody like Bronco knocking a horse down. <laughs> so you end up playing for two coaches at Stowe. Coach Fortney gets on, gets a, a bigger job. And your senior year, you play under Bob Boat. And he had an interesting connection to Syracuse, which got you to go to a Syracuse Pitt Panther game and then introduction to a man who would have a major impact on your life. So who was that man and how did it advance your career? When Coach Volk took me over to introduce me to Ben Schwartzwalder at Syracuse, uh, you know, they were playing uh, Pittsburgh. It was actually my, it was between my junior and my senior year. It was after the season of my junior year and Coach Volk came down. He was appointed to be the next year's head coach in my senior year. And uh, he asked me, uh, he'd seen me run in the film, you know, he'd studied the films before he took the job in uh, my junior year and he wanted uh, 
he was very close to Syracuse. He had, there's a number of kids. When he coached up at Solon High School, just north of Stowe, where I grew up, he sent uh, uh, Megases and uh, Paglios. There was probably three different uh, uh, families that uh, boys from the families that went to Solon for played for him went to Syracuse. So I had heard about the Syracuse connection, and I knew about it. And he asked me if I, my junior year before uh, the season was over for the college, if I'd like to go to the uh, game over in Pittsburgh. And I went and got a chance to meet Ben Schwarzwalder and uh, walked in, saw the college, uh, the whole college set up, the locker room, everything after the game, shook hands with him. And Ben, you know, he had quite a, quite a record. He was a, he jumped in the Black Forest in World War II, and it, most people that have a military presence or know a little bit about World War II, when you say he jumped in the Black Forest, that's all you have to say, because that was a, literally a, a near suicide mission to divide the attention of the German front <clears throat> when they were when they were moving through the front line to create a diversion, and that's what they did, and it was near suicidal. Over 50% of the guys that uh, I've heard that over 50% of the people that participated in that Black Force thing didn't come back. So Ben had quite a history, and I, I was aware of that. I hadn't read about it yet. I, later on, I did, but uh, he was a guy that <clears throat> had commanded troops in the Second World War and was quite a football coach, and he said something that caught my eye, <laughs> or that caught my ear. He said, uh, when you throw the ball, three things can happen, and two of them are bad. And I thought, there's a guy that likes to run the ball, and that's where Jimmy Brown <clears throat> went to college, and he did a pretty good job, and so did Ernie Davis at that point. <laughs> I hadn't heard of Floyd Little yet. That came a little later. But I thought, if those two guys do that well there, Maybe I might have a shot, you know, because he believes in a power running game and wants to run the ball initially and stick with it. <clears throat> Even back then, that was uh, that was something you wanted to incorporate. I went down and visited Woody Hayes at Ohio State, and Woody got all the boys from Ohio in a room after he met with the whole contingency outside. He pulled us Ohio boys into a room, and he got up in front of us, and he hit the desk real hard with his hand and looked at us and said, all of you owe it to your state to go to Ohio State. And I thought, wait a minute. You know, I've been shoveling cow manure. for. <laughs> I didn't figure I owed anybody anything. And I thought, if that guy will say that, I don't know. You know, I don't know. I don't think he's looking at me as a running back. And, I, you know, most the heaviest running back I'd ever been in Ohio State at that time was uh, 220 pounds, I think. Hayes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I thought Syracuse is where I need to, to line up with. And that gives you a little bit of the pieces of history that I got to put together as a high school kid trying to decide where I was going to go. And when I shook hands with Ben Schwarzer, he looked me square straight in the eye. He said, I'd like you to come to Syracuse. And I said, I I'll do that under one condition. And when I said that, you know, he's an old war veteran. He's He's been, <laughs> been coaching football ever since the Second World War. He kind of cleared his throat, pushed his glasses up on his face, looked at me. He's waiting for me to say, I want a Buick or something. <laughs> he said, well, what would that be? And I said, I'd just like you to have a, give me a fair look at running back, uh, you know, before you decide. I said, I'll play wherever you decide to play me, and I'll be honored to play for you. But I would like you my freshman year. See, back then, the freshman had to play a separate schedule. And we were like blocking dummies for the varsity, you know, the rest <laughs> of the season. And that's fine. That's the way it worked. But I knew on that freshman squad, if I ask him, if I just get an opportunity to run the ball a couple times, if he could, he, he would know whether I had the quality I thought I had or didn't. And uh, frankly, I wasn't that sure of myself, but at the same time, I wanted an opportunity. And just to get the opportunity, you got to find a guy that will live up to what he tells you. And I figured that Schwartz all when he shook my hand and cleared. when I said, I'd like you to give me a fair shot at, at being a fullback in my freshman year, he kind of got, you know, Ben wasn't a big, big smile, smack you on the back kind of guy. He kind of grinned and he, he just nodded. He said, I think we have a deal. And uh, he was a man of his word. And that's what happened. You know, the book is also a snapshot of a completely different era. Uh, you look at student athletes today compared to 
when you're in college, you're holding down two jobs with some great stories about that as well. Um, you're married, you have a son, all this takes place while you're in college, which was not uncommon then. In fact, you stayed in the book that marriage made you better equipped to handle Absolutely. all of that. Why is that? Why was that? Mark, AJ, you think, I don't know where you guys grew up, but I grew up in the country in Ohio. Um, kids acting, you know, out of line and doing screwy things got you in trouble. Just borrowing a bicycle, you know, got me in all kinds of trouble. When I went to Syracuse, I wasn't ever cut out. I didn't know anything about fraternities and sororities. I didn't know anything about all of that. And I just, uh, it was the first time I was around kids that weren't uh, fellow country type kids. And a lot of kids that were going to Syracuse at that time are from pretty upper class families. You know, Syracuse was a school that cost a lot of money to go to and to be living there in the dormitory. You know, there was, there was a very strong population of kids that got into the fraternities and sororities and I just realized I was a fish out of water I had no uh, uh I went to visit a fraternity and there was a guy sitting there wearing high heels they were, they were making the, the the pledges look ridiculous and to me that just looked twice as ridiculous as what it what it would normally would with normal people I guess and I thought I don't want any part of that I want to be away from that you know and I didn't put up with a lot of nonsense in the dormitory I where I grew up uh, you respected other people if you did something that infringed on them like banging on the door in the middle of the night at three o'clock you're allowed to get punched in the jaw and that's the way I handled things you know I just somebody came and beat on my door with a golf club because the fraternity told them to I opened the door and punched them in the head <laughs> well needless to say I had been in the dean's office two or three times and uh, it just it wasn't working out and then I went home my sophomore year and married my childhood sweetheart brought her back and uh, again, went to see Schwarzwalder, told him what I was going to do. He said, well, I don't agree with it. But he said, we can. He said, we will help you with that if you're if you're totally going to do it. I said, yes, sir, I am. And I'm, you know, I have no interest in living in the dormitory anymore. So I went home, married, got married, brought my wife back. And we lived off campus. They, the university and the coaches staff knew some people. And they got her a job. She had gone through to be a legal secretary, got her a good job downtown. And uh, lived in an apartment, and I worked a job on the side. The, the university, under strict NCAA rules, they could only accommodate you in so many capacities. You had anything over that, you had to earn the money yourself and bring it in. So they got me a legitimate job, and I found it's even a backup job with the university cleaning up some of the uh, dormitories and or some of the uh, gymnasiums uh, after hours. So I would be a night watchman for a Pontiac dealership, and then I would come back and scrub floors. I did a lot of mopping. I'm a pretty good mobster. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how, it, that's how it turned out. So one of your teammates in Syracuse was somebody who I think a lot of people forget actually played the game because they remember him as a coach. Can you tell us about the type of player wide receiver Tom Coughlin was and what qualities you saw then that helped make him such a good coach? <laughs> Tom? is genuine, whether it's being a player or a coach, just like I alluded to what Coach Schwartzholder, when he cleared his throat, pushed his glasses up and looked at me, I knew right then what kind of guy he was from my little experience in the country. When I met Tom Coughlin in the elevator and we we're going up and he said, hi, my name's Tom Coughlin, stuck his hand out, shook my hand, looked me right in the eye. He said, what position you play? And I said, running back. <laughs> and he said, what? <laughs> he leaned forward because he was a running back. It, I knew that Coughlin was going to be the kind of um, straightforward, you know, if, if Tom Coughlin tells you something, you can stand on it. You know, you don't have to worry about it sinking in the water. He's, he's uh, legitimate. And I read him that way when I first met him in September or August of 1964. And he never changed all the time. I've known him. I've just uh, uh, been very involved with him in the last few years again. And I enjoy his company. He's a great fella. And he, um, you know, he was in a situation where I was the fullback and Floyd Little was the halfback, our sophomore and junior years. And Tom, in order to get on the field at a halfback position, ended up being kind of the, the wide receiver. He was in between a halfback and a, more of a receiver than a halfback. 
And uh, but that see that some guys would get disillusioned with that and not uh, not follow through. Not Coughlin. He decided that that's the what was served him. That's what the meal was going to be. So he was going to make the most of it, and he did. And he went on. You know, he was a very good player. He went on and became. He really liked football and wanted to have it in his repertoire. So right after school, he went on his, and worked his way up through the assistant coaching situations and and uh, aspired to become a head coach and finally did and uh, ended up being the uh, head coach down there at Jacksonville for a few years before he went to New York and then played against the Patriots in a game that I was very involved in, even though I was retired because the Patriots were looking to go for the undefeated season. <laughs> And guess who was coaching the team that stopped them? None other than Tom Coughlin, my 1964 companion and uh, fellow running back at Syracuse. Amazing. So out of college, you drafted uh, by the Miami Dolphins, um, which you were, we were fine with. You thought maybe you'd go to one of those Midwest, you know, prototypical, you know, places where running backs go, but you were not disappointed by, by going to Miami. But that rookie year, fifth game rookie season at home against Buffalo, you're knocked out, you suffer a concussion, head to the ground during a tackle, you spend two days in the hospital, three weeks later at San Diego, you suffer another concussion, plus a ruptured eardrum, broken nose. The training staff was way ahead of their time. They even tried to design a special helmet for you. Didn't work out so well. Uh, but you note in the book how physically and mentally tough your rookie season was. And it wasn't the rookie season you envisioned. How did you deal with, with that first taste of professional football being such a, a tough season? Well, the really tough part came right at the end of the season when I got the injury. Uh, or suffer the first injury and then a repertoire of re-injuring that same kind of thing um, made it made it very tough. Uh, the next year, trying to stay healthy through the course of that, uh, it was a challenge. You know, it was just a toss of a coin when I received that first bad uh, head injury, that first concussion. It was literally a toss of a coin whether that was going to end my career or not. And uh, luckily. We had some doctors that uh, at our disposal through Mercy Hospital there in Miami that uh, knew what they were doing. And uh, they kept me out long enough that I I got through it. And uh, then, you know, went through 1969 and had had some revisited that injury situation a little bit, but not, not as critically. But then in 1970, uh, the thing that cured my headaches was a guy named Shula. <laughs> he came in and reorganized that offensive line and hired a guy named Monty Clark, who was a great offensive tackle at Cleveland for the Browns and blocked for Jimmy Brown. I remember as a kid when I snuck in the stadium, like I told you before, watching and hearing Monty Clark's name mentioned on the PA system. And uh, when he came and started to put that offensive line together with me, trust me, fellas, when I tell you, my headaches started to go away. <laughs> suddenly they started to go away you know people like Langer and Kuchenberg and Larry Little started to show up and they were starting to be synchromesh and I started to know as much about their blocking tendencies as I read in that book in junior high I started to know when they would call and decide on the front that they were looking at on how they were going to block it and I can't emphasize this enough and I put this in the book and I, I just touch on it right here but a really good power running back, a little bit like what Philly has right now, what Philadelphia, you'll see it. A really good power running back in the backfield listens to the calls that his offensive linemen are going to make. And he knows by the way the defense is shuffling. You can't look directly where you're going to run, but you just feel the whole vision. You, 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 you take in the whole field. And you hear your linemen talking, whether they're going to X or cross, they're calling all kinds of things, but you know what's live. And that tells you that that defense is moving over there and that the snap of the ball, what the offensive linemen are going to do. So you're already visualizing that in your head of what's going to happen, who's going to loop around, who's going to block back. And you're going to have a pretty good idea where the crack's going to be. See, if you don't have that, 
you collide with your offensive line and you run into them, knock them off their blocks or mess the whole thing up. But if you understand how that works, this is going clear back to how Saldus said, you know, told me how to diagram the play. If you have that, then you hit that crack right at the same instant as they're making their blocks. Now you have a power running game. If you have that, you have it. If you don't have that exactly the way I just described it, you've got a used car instead of a new Cadillac. <laughs> you got to face the facts. You look in the entire NFL today, and there's only one or two instances where you see what I'm talking about. It's a dying thing in the NFL. It's going, the rules have changed terrifically on the passing game, and so be it. But whoever has that, whoever can make that two yards consistently, you know, when it's third and two on the one, or third and two on the goal line, you know, third and goal to go, you've got to have that understanding in order to power that ball across and have a shot. You just run into your big offensive guard's big butt with your head, that isn't going to work. You got to know where he's going to be and you got to fit in that crack in between he and the center. I'm getting into the intricacies. I'm sorry, fellas. I get too I get I get excited no, about it. No, know? it's great and it's also interesting because um there's a great story about how some of that greatness of that offensive line is built, you know, chance, you know, meeting at a Jaguar dealership while you're getting your bumper fixed. Just so so many amazing things. Um but I have to tell you, I found every single word that you wrote about Don Schuler in that book absolutely fascinating we've had larry little mercury morris on the show and they speak at length about him and i actually felt your pain during your retelling of that first camp with the 12 minute run the four days but in speaking in reading your book and in speaking to, to larry and mercury morris in the back of my mind they were the same exact stories that every one of the 1980 olympic hockey guys that we've had on over the years talked about her brooks they, those two seem like two peas in a pod. What made Don Schuler such a great head coach? He lived it. He just didn't act it. He lived it. When he told you it was going to be this way, you could build a house on that. Remember I talked to you about Ben Schwartzwalder pushing his glasses up and look at looking at me? And in that moment, I knew that guy right there what he says, he'd rather die than change what he said. Well, Don Shula came on to us in 1970, had all these things on the wall. When the going gets tough, the tough get going. You got to have the winning edge. And I thought that's all a bunch of crap. You know, it's all on the wall and that's nice. But, you know, guys that run around spouting little, little poems, you know, about this is how we're going to do this. And all gung-ho, I thought, nah, it all boils down to whether we can, when it's third and two, or, you know, goal line and, and goal to go. That's when, the, that in the trenches, that's when it's for real. So I didn't, at first, I didn't take him, you know, and, and doing all the long distance running that he wanted to get us into shape with and all that thing, I didn't agree with that. You know, football is a <laughs> very physical sport, but it's played in like 15 second increments. And then you got a minute or a minute and a half to rest in between plays. You don't have to be a cross country runner. It helps, sure. I agree. But see, he had a whole program set up that he wanted us to follow. And I mistrusted that at first. And I thought, you know, this is a, it's kind of a sham. I don't see me fitting in here. And that's when I went in his office and said, he, he said, when you come in my office, you don't have to address me as coach anymore. It's just man to man. Well, I took him at his word. What have I got to lose? I'm, you know, I'm so, so running back in 1969. I walked into his office and shut the door. And he said, uh, what do you think? I said, I think I don't like you very much. He said, well, that's good. He says, we've got something in common because I don't like you much either. <laughs> that's the way he opened up. And I thought this guy may be for real. Now, what I'm leading up to, you asked me about the quality of Don Shule as a head coach. I didn't think much of him at all when I first met him and what he was doing with the team and how he was running it. I didn't see how that was going to help us to win, but it did. And we started to win and the proof in the pudding was right there. As time went on, I started to realize that he just didn't spout those things. He lived by them. He was those things. And as time went on, I realized he's just like Ben Schwartzwalder. He's just like Tom Coughlin. 
He's like the fellows I told you about I've met in my life that you could, you know, he is what he portrayed himself as. And as ridiculous as it seemed to me at first, as it, you can't argue with the fact that when you start winning in the pros, I don't care if he wanted me to play jacks on, you know, jumping jacks on the, on the sidewalk. If he said that's what you need to do in order, after playing for him for a couple of years, I'd believe him and I'd, I'd try it. <laughs> as, as ridiculous as it seems, I would try it because that's how he struck me at, in 1970 when he showed up. And as we started to win, he took a team that was the worst team in the league and turned it around in a year to be a contender. And <laughs> think about that. You know, if you, if you weren't for real, you'd never, you'd never make it up the side of that mountain. And he was for real. And once I to answer your question, that's when I realized he is for real. And as time went on, I learned more and more about him. And that guy, when you talk about a man of his word, Don Shula was the epitome of that. You know, we should have you know, laid this on a coin. You tell a story in the book, it's sort of interesting and related to that, but what an honorable person he was, but how I guess you practiced which team it was uh, uh, in the locker room, you found the defensive plan for the game. He took it to Monty yeah. Clark and he took it to Shuler and tell the story of what Shuler did once he learned about that. That made him an honorable guy. Coach Clark walked up when I had this defensive uh, uh, game plan that Oakland had devised and you know we had to use Oakland's locker room because of some mess up uh, the day before the game and I went and found Art Tom's locker who played with me at Syracuse who's a defensive lineman and uh, I was going to leave him a note on something so I was looking around for some paper in his locker to uh, leave him a note and I discovered down shoved down in a in a uh, shoe that that's in his locker there's the defensive game report now again you remember when I talked to you about I don't, I'm not a guy that'll go try to cheat, you know, to grab the ref or nothing. I'm not going to do that. But when you hand me the other team's defensive game plan, <laughs> I'm sitting there looking at it. Damn, that's hard to turn down. You know, I didn't, I didn't seek it. I found it. <laughs> There's a difference for me. So I handed it to coach Clark, coach Clark walks up and said, what's that? I said, Monty, I don't know what this is. I never seen it. And if you say I did, I'll say I didn't, you know, I hand it to him. And he said, okay. And he turns and takes off. Well, we lose the game. That's the first game we lost in a 17 game winning streak, by the way, this is 1973. And then a couple games into the ne next season, we were still winning every game. He takes it to coach Shula. You know, we've got their defensive plan. When we zig, this is what they're going to do to zag. All right. By the time they realize we know what they're going to do by reading their plan, we'll be two touchdowns ahead what I think. So I'm kind of liking this, you know, I hand it to coach Clark, coach Clark takes it. We lose the game. I'm, I see Clark after the game. I said, what the hell, what happened? He said, I took it to coach Shula and he, he wouldn't even look at it. He said, destroy it. I said, what? I said, why did you, why did you take it to coach Shula? <laughs> you should have known he was, a, you should have taken it to the defensive coordinator. <laughs> but it was just, see, Shula didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk. Anybody else would have taken that and said, you know, if we do this, they're going to do that. So that means we could line up and do the, act like we're going to do this, but we're actually going to do that. <laughs> you know, we're actually going to go wide instead of portraying what we're, so, you know, we, a definite advantage, but Shula, that just, you know, as far as cheating, just isn't going to happen. He just wasn't going to do it. You know, let air out of football or something. I might lean that way myself, but not him. And, you know, saying it, a lot of us say it, but there's only a few guys that actually live by it. And that demonstrated to me, and it's my own cost. I've got to reveal myself. I'm not, I'm not trying to build myself up as somebody, you know, <laughs> I, when somebody hands me the game or a hand, you know, it falls into my lap. That's a different story. It's like the bicycle. I borrowed it, but I didn't really <laughs> steal it, you know, it goes back to the whole thing. But see, Shula, that's the difference, right? That's what I was trying to get. You guys both smile and laugh, but that is, that's, that's exactly the point. He said, this is what I am, and this is how I'm going to do it, and you're going to have to go with me or get the hell out of here. 
and I, I at first I mistrusted him, but then we started to win. But then I still had a question of whether he would bend the rules or not. You know, that's what we're talking about here, bending the rules and not flat out cheating. If we went and stole that, yes, that's flat out cheating. But if it falls in your lap, that's a different way of looking at it. But not him. You know, he was to the edge, you know, he that that's one quarter inch over the line and that won't he won't do it. And he proved that by doing that. And I thought, I'm going to put that in the book. I've never told too many people about that because I take a licking in it. But so what? It's the truth. And that's what happened. And that's when I realized he just doesn't talk it. He walks it. He lives it. And there are other examples in the book uh, over and above that, some of the things that make him, him so great. Um, obviously, you mentioned how he turned the fortunes around one year, you know, making the playoffs in his first season, the AFC Championship the second. New Orleans, the site of that Super Bowl, played a, a part in that embarrassing loss to the Cowboys that you described. But Coach Shula did not hesitate to use that loss as a teachable moment. Do you recall what Coach told you at the end of that game and then how he followed it up and opened up camp the next year. He got us all in the locker room, right? Right, well, that, right after the final gun, we all went in after Super Bowl six. Bob Lilly was kind enough to turn loose of my Adam's apple and set me on the ground at defensive lineman for Dallas. And I went in the locker room and Shula ran everybody else out of the locker room, all the media and everything. He made them all get out. And he shut the door and just, just us, we players and the assistant coaches and the training staff is the only people that were in there. And there's, it was like a funeral parlor, you know, it was just quiet. You could hear a pin drop. And he stepped up in front of us and looked at us. He said, I want every one of you to remember how you feel right now. He said, don't forget how you feel right now, because we're going to draw on this. And next year, we're going to treat every game as though it were the Super Bowl <clears throat> because we have to prove to ourselves that we can get that serious and that have that much intent to win, willing to sacrifice to win. In other words, you got to think about this each game. And I, you know, I, I'm thinking, how could we, my gosh, he's we, four day practices, you know, no water on the practice field, 90 degree heat. We're practicing. How much more can we do, you know, without dropping dead? And uh, I look over at Jim kick and he's, you know, we're all very serious because we just got our butts kicked by, by Dallas in a Super Bowl six. I look at Jim kick and he, he grins and winks at me and said, buckle up <laughs> 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 because he anticipated what Shula meant. And Shula did that. He never, he didn't say anything about going, you know, one game and winning every game. He didn't say that. He said, we're going to treat every game next year as though it were the Super Bowl. And we're going to draw on remembering how we feel from this moment. That's why I want you to remember it. Because we're going to draw on that in preparation to make sure we're serious and have our intent locked in on each opponent. He never said anything about winning them all. We didn't expect to do that. We got about halfway through the season before that even became a, you know, around seventh or uh, seventh or sixth or seventh game. We were the only ones still standing. And of course, everyone starts to, that makes it even more tough uh, to be honest with you, to, to go undefeated in the NFL by the sixth or seventh game, usually everybody's lost one. And, and then after that, if you still, if you're still undefeated, you become a target People start to, the, the teams that probably wouldn't get up to play you if you had already lost a game at 7-0, and they'll say, wait a minute, you know, we're going to be the ones, everybody wants to be the one to knock you off the stump. <laughs> and, and that's what happens. But because we drew on that feeling that he talked about, you know, I'm not going to insult your intelligence. It came very close, but every, that's the great thing about that season. Sure, they're stars, you know, they put me in the Hall of Fame, all this stuff, that's great. But my offensive lineman made the difference. It's a team, you know, uh, individual honors kind of kind of go to the side, even the Hall of Fame kind of goes, as, I wouldn't be in the Hall of Fame without Kuchenberg and Lang and those people in front of me. So don't, you know, <clears throat> you can't live a false dream. <clears throat> we were the team, but the way we got to be that team was by his pushing and remembering that feeling. See, he had been through it at the hands of Namath in what, Super Bowl three, lost his job, came down to the Dolphins, rebuilt. <clears throat> he remembered the feeling. 
And he wanted us to remember it because he wanted to be, have us be as dedicated as he was going to be in that next season. And believe it or not, that's exactly what happened. And not just the stars, the guys that were in on the kicking team, you know, different times, different places, a guy that wasn't even a starter made the difference in us winning the game. Charlie Babb against Cleveland, you know, blocks it, scores, you know, on special teams, uh, a rookie on top of it made the difference. It's just that little tiny bit of difference. And that's what might as well be the universe. So when you, you talk about it, oh, perfection from game one, all the way through the Super Bowl, once in all the time. And that's why we're named the number one team in the history of the NFL because of that. It's absolutely <clears throat> incredible. And, and obviously you had such a, a huge part in that season. You had a career best uh, over 1,100 yards rushing. You, you led rushers in the Super Bowl, 112 yards on only 15 carries. Um, I, I still think that if you just needed one video to show someone, to, to show them what Larry Zonka is, um, it would probably be, you know, that run in the Super Bowl where basically you run for 49 year, yards, but at the end of that that run, it's almost like a video game, what you do to Pat Fisher, who was known as a fearless and, and, and gritty tackler. I mean, you threw him off like he was just like a pillow in your way. Um, you know, you mentioned, you know, what Jim said to you, buckle up and, and you know, how, you know, he wanted everyone to experience that loss. I'm just wondering, you, you did mention all the talent that team had. Do you think any other coach could have gotten everything that Coach Shula got out of you? Um, or was he just the right guy for that group of players? Well, quite honestly, Mark, yes, yes to all those things that you just said about Shula. But the other thing that Shula did prior to that season <laughs> was that he put one of the best coaching staffs, I think, in the history of the NFL that's ever been put together. If you look at Arnsbarger and the different Schnellenberger, the, the guys that were his assistant coaches, they were the brains of the outfit. And Shula was the driving force. But Arnsbarger and Schnellenberger devised game plans that were the best I've ever been around. Now, to have that kind of staff, you have to have what Shula had in order to put that kind of staff together because he understood what kind of guys and what kind of personalities and what kind of experience he was looking for when he hired them. But that constituted, <clears throat> when I say Shula was a driving force, he was. But he also put together the best assistant coaching staff that I've ever seen or ever heard of. <clears throat> and when you talk about the how close it came down to in the 72 season, yes, it did. But the winning edge that he call, called it that little bit of difference many times rested with those assistant coaches that saw little glitches by studying the film. These guys came in two hours before we started in training camp and stayed an hour after. Think about their schedules. Think about what they went through and the sacrifices they made compared to what we players made. You know, we came in two hours after they were already there and they were still around two hours after we left going through meetings and rehearsing and Shula pushed them just as hard, if not harder than he pushed us. And they were under the same thing. Remember what happened. You know, think about it. Now, when you have those, when you have those entities, when you have that head coach, that, like we're talking about Don Shula, then you have that group of assistant coaches, Monty Clark, Howard Schnellenberger, Arnsbarger, oh, Arnsbarger. It, it, you have seven coaches, just seven, not 17 like today, just seven. <laughs> <laughs> and and they are as dedicated and into it as the as the head guy is asking us to be, us players to be. And that continues through the course of the season. How rare is that? You know, when you talk about the greatest team, you know, the best team in the history of the NFL, that's great. But you got to really, it, the word team designates, you, you think of the starting players, but the backup players, the coaches, the, 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 the uh, medical staff, the equipment guys, all the people that were in that were all part of this mob. And it was a hand-picked mob by Shula. <laughs> he inherited those players, but he added players to it. Kuchenberg, Langer, there are several, but he added to it. But he put that coaching staff together that, that could hone it and bring it down. I get a kick out of every year when I go back to the Hall of Fame. Whenever I sit next to Joe Namath, Namath will sit down beside me. 
and we'll talk. We'll exchange the pleasantries, you know, how you doing? Good, I'm doing it. And then <clears throat> every year, Namath will sit there for a little while and then he'll look at me and go, you know, those two safeties of yours, <laughs> and it started on Dick Anderson and Jake Scott because they were the two pin, you know, pinnacle guys, and it was a strong safety, weak safety. And they were so good at, divide, at, at uh, disguising what they were doing on defense that Namath could hardly get through a game without throwing at least one interception to one of them. And it just still drives him crazy. It's still, you know, it's been six or 50 years ago. And Namath will sit there for a little while and he goes, you know, that Anderson, he'd line up. <laughs> and Namath would think he had the read and he'd go to throw it to single coverage and there's Anderson standing in front of him, <laughs> intercepting the ball. I get a kick out of that. And that gives you <laughs> an idea 50 years later that name is still talking to me about trying to figure out how they did what they did. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. I remember those games at Chase Dame very well. It's like, um, you know, when, when Joe was playing, I mean, I, I did sit through a lot of Bob Davis and Al Woodall, but um, so <laughs> Kurt, Kurt Flood, Andy Messersmith and Marvin Miller get so much credit for advancing the amount baseball players get paid. But you, Jim Kick, and poor Warfield uh, moved to the WFL, played a huge part in raising salaries. But it also made that 1974 season very difficult, which, you know, now, you know, you look at your career, Jim's career, and, and poor Warfield's career with the Dolphins, it's almost unfathomable that you guys would be booed. How difficult was that season? Oh, I think the first game when we came out, we were booed because we, uh, when they introduced us. But I think people, when you're fans, they boo the fact that we were leaving, yes. Uh, and I, I agree with them. I mean, you know, but the bottom line is it is pro football. And when you talk about getting a multiple of five of your salary <clears throat> or more, uh, is what you're playing for being offered five times or six times that um, on a guaranteed continuous basis. Uh, that's hard to turn down professionally. <laughs> so I agree. You know, I, I didn't feel good about the fact that we were leaving, but at the same time, you have to make that decision. Um, so I understood why they booed. I, I, you know, I, I, but they didn't boo us through the whole season. We got into that yeah. season. We, we lost in the playoffs to Oakland, but um uh, we did pretty good in that during that course of that season and the fans they they're quick to boo you but they're just as quick to 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 uh cheer you on particularly when you score and uh i think as time went on through the season we got that and i've got a lot of fan mail after the season and a lot of folks that that wrote you know i over the years i got to read them i kept a lot of it and uh, read it and they understood why i did what i did but they you know hoped that i would come back and then I had an opportunity where I did. I got to come back for the last year I played. You know, the money aside, things didn't really go as you planned with the WFL. You're supposed to start playing Toronto. Team got moved to Memphis before you played. The league folded after a couple of years. Do you ever have any regret about making the move? Uh, the contracts we signed... <clears throat> And I'll answer your question, but at first I need to stipulate this so it so it makes sense what I'm about to say. We signed personal services contracts because our agent Ed Keating had, you know, he envisioned what could happen with the world with the uh, what was that the world league we jumped to, um, <laughs> and he was afraid that it might collapse. So we signed personal guarantees from John Bassett. I actually signed a personal services contract for the football season for the next three years. And whatever John Bassett decided he wanted to have me do, I guess I'd wash his car if I needed to. <laughs> he was going to pay me that amount of money during those course of those months for the next three years. And that's, you know, that's how that happened. Um, so I wouldn't have left if that wouldn't have been the scenario. And I wouldn't have left if it wouldn't have been for the kind of money that we're talking about. You know, five or six times the regular salary, there was a signing bonus, nearly half a million dollars involved. Um, I bought a big farm and, well, changed my life doing what I did. But John was on the hook. Now the thing folds. You know, the other owners get together, it folds. 
you know, first we were supposed to play in Toronto at a beautiful thing. And there was all the Canadian fans, blah, blah. We get transferred, transferred, end up in training camp down in Senatobia, Mississippi. And we're going to play in Memphis, which wasn't all bad because I got to meet Elvis. <laughs> really liked, uh, really liked Elvis. He was uh, a great football fan, really into it. But there we go down there. And then the league collapses in just a matter of three, four weeks. It drops. Well, there I am sitting there looking at John Bassett going, where's your car? You want me to get a bucket of water? I'm going to wash it for you. you know? <laughs> Pay me half a million dollars a year to wash your car. What are you going to do? He said, let's investigate what can happen in the NFL by going back. So we went back and found somebody to pick up the contract or pick up the predominant amount of the contract and went back in. But that's where it got tough with Joe Robbie. I really wanted, and this answers one of your previous questions as well. I really wanted to come back to the Dolphins. But again, here's a scenario. Now, Coach Arnsbarger had left the assistant coach. He had left from Miami and become the head coach at uh, the Giants. Joe Robbie said, this is a ridiculous contract. I'm not, not going to pay this at all. So one thing led to another. I ended up signing with the Giants. But right then, if I had that to go back to, um, I might not have been as... Uh, you know, I might have investigated that a little deeper before I just said, let's go with the Giants. You know, I might have given that some more thought. I really like my time with the Giants. I like the people. I love the, the family that owns the Giants. But at the same time, uh, it just didn't it didn't ever come together there. And I ended up uh, my last year, I went back to Miami and we did pretty good. But uh, again, got lost in that first playoff game. This book is just incredible. It has so many great stories in it. It's not your first book. How does this book differ from the 1973 <laughs> book you did with Jim Kick? And that was called Always on the Run. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Dave Anderson came to us from the Miami Herald. And uh, Dave Anderson was a, a, kind of a close friend besides being a sports writer. And uh, said he wanted to do the book and everything. We hadn't done the you know, we we're just starting, unbeknownst to us, the undefeated season. And we did it, but he did it. Uh, Dave Anderson wrote that book. He interviewed us and then put us down in quotes in the book. And if you look at what, well, how could you write any easier book than having a professional writer sit over there, ask you questions, and then, you know, you go in through and proofreading it, taking out whatever you want to take out, hand it back to him, and he goes and has a press. I thought writing a book, hell, it's a cinch. Well, you know, writing that book through the course of that season and having it come out when we were undefeated, it just went nuts. I mean, we sold books. My gosh, we sold a ton of books. And everybody's after to write another book. I'm like, sure, what the heck, you know? <laughs> but I never took time to do it. And I, 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 even in that book, I think I put in, you know, I was, I was driven to play football, but I was more driven to go to Alaska. I, you know, I wanted to see the last frontier. I, you know, I'd grow up, I grew up on a farm in Ohio and I just lusted after the things I read about Daniel Boone and Davy Crockett. And when there was a, the frontier was out in the West and you could go, my great grandmother told me stories about riding in a covered wagon from, from uh, Kentucky to Texas when she was a little girl. I just wanted to experience that. And I kept hearing and seeing that Alaska was the last frontier and I was afraid it was going to disappear before I could get to it. And, uh, so I was I was motivated in that direction, and uh, things came about. And I had I not got sidetracked into football, I probably would have uh, made my way up there to Alaska. And and uh, but I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm not at least a bit upset that I went <laughs> went to football. But to answer your question, you started. I got off on a on a beat, but I when I came back, uh, I would have. Uh, it would have been nice to have gone back to the Dolphins, but I went to the Giants, and then the last year, I came back and played for Shula there, and uh, uh, I was glad I had an opportunity to do that. We just got into the one playoff game and lost at the hands of John Madden, who was still smarting from the def <laughs> from the loss we handled, handed him before. But it, uh, it's funny how things go around and come around in the NFL, isn't it? Yeah. You know, another theme runs in the book, and actually the title sort of threw me in that direction a little bit, is the toll football took on your teammates, especially you know Jim Kick, and actually it's really touching. At the end of Jim Kick's life, he was helped by Mercury Morris. It wasn't just Kick who fell victim to CTE. It was Nick Bonacondi's, Bob Kuchenberg's, Earl Morrill. 
And you know, you're worried that someday you may feel some of the effects. So looking back, is there anything you would have done differently or advise your friends and teammates to do differently if you know what the health effects would be long-term? I don't think any of us had even a tiniest clue of, uh, you know, we thought at the time we played that we were as protected as you possibly could be. Look at what preceded us. Look at the leather helmets and the things that happened to the players that preceded us. There was a, a kind of a, a, a general theme of the game is as safe as it could ever be. You know, it's more safe now. And Rydell came out with a suspension helmets and you went to the hard and case helmet and everything. Nobody knew about the, the later effects and head on collisions started to happen more frequently because you didn't actually break each other's skulls when you ran into each other. Um, you thought you were safe. We presumed that we were. Had we known otherwise, I, I don't know how many of the players would have backed away. I don't know that. But I think had the people in charge of the NFL known that earlier, they would have changed the rules so that they're just like today. There's no absolute head on. You can't lead with your head with the intent of hitting people. When I was in junior high and the Rydell helmets, they had solid pad helmets and then you had suspension helmets coming out in the early 60s, as I recall. And, and I got that. The coaches were teaching you to lead with your head, to hit the other opponent in the chest with your head. You know, put your nose right in his chest to tackle him. And don't be afraid. Your helmets will protect your head, was, I was told. And that's the perception and, and we had of that going along at that time. Now, over years, that has been proven that it, that it wasn't the case. But we didn't know that at the time. You know, hindsight's always 2020, and you understand. But because today, do I agree with all the rules changes? No. But at the same time, they're designed to protect the players and make the game more competitive. Have they done that? Yes, they have. So who, who am I to argue with the player's safety and the competitiveness of the game? When I played, and... You could knock a receiver off his feet anytime you wanted until the ball was in the air. Think about that. Think about today's receivers uh, not, not being able to get off the line of scrimmage without being crossbodied, which are legal. Uh, that could happen then. Now it's, it's a great deal different. But in the time that I played, if you had a two touchdown or three touchdown lead by halftime, people got up and went home because they knew it was over. Now, now, if you get up, somebody else will sit in your seat because it ain't over till it's over. How many games this year, just this year, think about it. How many games in the NFL came right down to the closing seconds? Probably a third, perhaps a quarter of them to a third of them came down to the closing seconds. People right on the edge of their seats. That's pro football. That's what it should be. You should get the entertainment for your dollar spent. So it's better now than it probably ever has. Now, when you start comparing the players from today to the players of yesterday, uh, now I'm going to argue with you because you got to look at those rules and look at those changes. You don't see many players playing to the age of Earl Morrill back in our day. He was very rare. Today, you see that here and there. Greatest of all time, I've got a problem with that. Greatest of their time, I have no problem with, you know, of their time. Because you got to look at what 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 the conditions are and what you have to play under, and that changes every decade. You know, one of the one of the biggest uh, guys that influenced that the most of changing and going more pass than run was a guy named Shulo on the rules committee. Go back and look. Amazing. Speaking of Shula. Um, lastly, the, the second to last chapter, Homecoming, has excerpts of Coach Shula's speech for your induction into the Football Hall of Fame, part of which uh, included the following. Behind all this success was Larry Zonka. He was simply the best fullback of his time. On first down, his average was 4.5 a carry. And when it got tough on third and short, everyone knew 39 would end up with the ball. A five time all pro choice he had the respect of his peers there there is a lot of intelligence and talent on our super bowl teams but i know where the heart was number 39 larry zonka so 35 years later when you're putting those words down on paper for your book 
what's the the central theme that's going through your head when you're recapturing those words that Coach Shula said about you? I like to believe uh, that he was a good speech maker and and meant what he said. I never knew him to say anything that he didn't really believe. And I, while he said I was the heart of the team, he didn't say I was the only heart of the team. You got to look at what he didn't say as well as what he said. And I'm not trying to do, tear down what he said. I, I appreciate that. And he saw that. He knew. You remember earlier in our conversation, we first started, I told you about when I was a kid, I just hated to lose. So did Shula. The majority of players on that 72 team had that same thing. All right. Yes, I was one of the people that were the heart. So was Jay Scott. So was Manny Fernandez on the defense. And look at the defense. The better they do, the less they play. Think about that. The better the offense does, the more they play. <laughs> so <laughs> the more ball control you have, the longer you stay on the field. So you get much more publicity than that. So the stars are, are singled out. There were a lot of people that had the heart and the heartbeat of that team. I think uh, Don paid me a, a great compliment uh, when he said what he said, and I appreciate it. But I'm not going to over, it's not to be overstated. It's still a team. And no matter what's said about any one of us, we all enjoy the overall team stat that we were undefeated and the best team in the in the history of the NFL. That is more important than any personal accolade or any personal goal that was attained. We as a team did that. And sometimes the whole team, no matter how great the, the stars were, came down to one player who was a backup player making a play that kept us in that in that state of being undefeated. So I, I'm not going to demote that. I'm not going to say anything against that. I'm appreciative that Don said that. But there were many of us that were the heart of the 72 scene. On some days, it was some of the guys that were probably one step from being traded <laughs> that made the difference that year. And when we get together, that's probably the most enjoyable part of being part of the 72 team is when we get together, <clears throat> all the guys are all co-mingled and setting amongst us. And there's as much camaraderie today as there was back then. Now, it's a reason we're so happy to get together again. And it's it, everybody, you're sitting there and we're talking about different plays and different games and different funny things that happen. And the guys that were on the field the most certainly get, a, get a, perhaps get a little more to say, but everybody has the say because at one point or another, everybody on that team had a hand and making a difference. And that I keep going back to that. I'm appreciative of his words, but there are a lot of us that were the heart of the 72 team. All right. Thanks so much for your time. We, we really appreciate it. More importantly, thank you for being one of my all time favorite players from an amazing <laughs> era of football. And, you know, um, sometimes when you have doing this as long as AJ and I have been doing this and, and you get an opportunity to, um, you know, meet and talk to your idol. Sometimes it doesn't live up to your expectations. This has exceeded, you know, any of our wildest expectations. Yeah, really appreciated the time you gave us today and, and for a wonderful book. And uh, thanks for being on with us. Mark, AJ, it was my honor. Anytime you guys want to do it again, let me know. I'm going to try to write a book about Alaska in a couple of years. I'll be calling on you. <laughs> we're, we're waiting for the American Gladiators book. <laughs> oh geez, American Gladiator. That could be a book. That could be certainly. Yeah, I never thought about that. Thank you for <laughs> giving me that. That was a that was a trip. <laughs> All right, Larry. Be good. Thanks so much. Okay. See you later, fellas.